Live from Midtown Manhattan, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in New York City in Manhattan for Big Data NYC, our event we've been doing five years in conjunction with Strata Data, which was formerly Strata Hadoop, which was formerly Strata Conference, formerly Hadoop World. We've been covering the big data space, going down 10 years now. This is theCUBE, I'm here with Aaron Kalb, who's the, the head of product and co-founder at Elation. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you on. So, uh, co-founder, head of product, love these conversations because <laughs> you, you're also founder, so it's a great mm -hmm. co-founder. Um, so it's your company, you got a lot of equity uh, interested in that. But also head of product, you, get to, you have to have the 20 mile stare on what the future looks while well, well, inventing it today, bringing it to market. Um, so you guys have an interesting take on the collaboration of data. Talk about what the means, what's the, what's the motivation behind that positioning? What's the core thesis around elation? Totally, so the thing we've observed is a lot of people working in the data space are concerned about the, the, the data itself. How can we make it cheaper to store, faster to process, and we're really concerned with the, the human side of it. Right? Data is only valuable if it's used by people. How do we help people to find the data, understand the data, trust uh, uh, in, in the data? And that involves a mix of, of um, algorithmic approaches and also human collaboration, both human to human and human to computer to get that all it's organized. You have a symbolic background, some systems from Stanford, worked at yeah. Apple, involved in Siri, all this kind of futuristic stuff. You can't go without a date with you about Alexa's going to have voice activity, you got Siri. AI is taking a really big part of it. That's obviously all about the hype right now, but what it means is the software is going to play a key role as an interface. And the symbolic system so almost brings on this neural network kind of vibe where objects, data, mm -hmm. plays a critical role. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And in the early days when we were co-founding the company, you know, we talked about like, what is Siri for the enterprise, right? Uh, I was you know, very excited to work on Siri, um, and it's really kind of a fun gimmick, and it's really useful when you're in the car, your hands are covered in you know, cookie dough. But uh, if you could answer questions like, what was revenue last quarter in the UK, and get the right answer fast, and have that dialogue to, oh, do you mean fiscal quarter or calendar quarter? You know, do you mean you know, UK, including Ireland, or you know, whatever it is? Uh, that would really enable better decisions and, and a better yeah, and, and I always worry that Siri might do something here. Hey, Siri. Oh, there it is, okay, be careful. <laughs> I don't want it to answer, take over my job. Automation <laughs> will take away the job. Maybe Siri will be doing interviews. Okay, let's take a step back. Okay, so you guys are doing well, you start up, you got some great funding, mm -hmm. great investors. Um, how are you guys doing on the product? Give us a quick highlight on where you guys are. Obviously this is big data NYC, a lot going on. It's Manhattan, you got financial mm -hmm. services, big industry here. Totally. You got the Strata Data event, which is the, the classic Hadoop industry that's morphed into data which really is overlapping with cloud, IOT, application developments, all kind of coming together. How do you guys fit into that world? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the idea of the, the data lake is kind of interesting. Um, psychologically, it's sort of a, a, a hoarder mentality, right? It's like, oh, everything I ever had, I want to keep in the attic because I might need it one day. Great opportunities, we have all these new streams of data, you know, with IOT and whatnot, but just because you can get to it physically doesn't mean it's easy to find the thing you want, you know, the needle in all that big haystack, and to distinguish among all the different um, assets that are available, which is the one that's, that's actually trustworthy for your need. So we find that all these trends make the need for a catalog to kind of organize that information and get what you want all the more uh, valuable. This has come up a lot. I want to get into the integration piece and how you're dealing with your partnerships, but the data lake integration has been huge and having the catalog has come up with uh, it's been the buzz, I and mean, foundationally people are saying catalogs are important. Why is it important to do the catalog work up front with a lot of the data strategies? It's a great question. So we see data cataloging as sort of step zero, right? Before you can prep the data in a tool like Trifactor, or Paxata, or Kylo, before you can visualize it in a tool like Tableau or MicroStrategy, before you can do some sort of cool, you know, a, a, a prediction of what's going to happen in the future with a data science engine, before any of that, these are all garbage in, garbage out processes. So step zero is, find the relevant data, understand it so you can get it in the right format, you know, trust it that it's good, and then you can do whatever comes next. And governance has become a key thing here. We're here to the regulations, GDPR and outside the United States, but also that's going to have a, uh, an arm's length reach over into the United States impact. So these little decisions, and there's going to be an Equifax someday out there, another one's probably going to come around the corner. Right. How does the policy injection change the catalog equation because a lot of people are building machine learning algorithms on top of catalogs and they're worried that they might have to rewrite everything. So how do you balance the trade-off between good catalog design 
and flexibility on the algorithm side. Totally, yes. Yeah, so it's a complicated thing with, with governance and, and, and consumption, right? It's people who are concerned with mm -hmm. keeping the data safe and people are concerned with turning that data into real value. And these can seem to be at odds. What we find is actually a catalog as a foundation for both, and they're not as opposed as they seem, right? So what Alation fundamentally does is we make a map of where the data is, who's using what data, when, how. Right? And that can actually be helpful if your goal is to say, let's follow in the footsteps of the best analysts and make more insights yeah. generated. Or if you want to say, hey, you know, this data is being used a lot, let's make sure it's being used correctly. So and by the right people. people. And by the right people, I mean, you exactly. Can start to have eager facts, they were fishing that pond dry you know, months, months before it actually happened. With good tools like this, they might have seen this, right? Am I getting it right? That's exactly right. Yeah, how can you observe what's going on to yeah. make sure that it's compliant yeah. and that the answers are correct and it's happening quickly and driving results? So in a way, you're taking the collective intelligence of the user behavior and using that into understanding what to do with the data modeling? That's exactly right. We want to make each person in your organization as knowledgeable, basically, as all of their peers combined, right? So the benefit then for the customer would be if you see something that's developing, you can double down on it. And if the users are using a lot of data, then you can provision more technology, more software. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's sort of like uh, when I was going to Stanford, you know, there was a place where the grass was all dead because people were riding their bikes diagonally across it. And then somebody, you know, smart was like, we're going to put a real gravel path there. <laughs> yeah. So the, you know, the, the infrastructure should follow the usage instead of being something that you try to enforce on people who might it's be It's a classic design anymore. meme that goes around, you know, <laughs> good design is here, but the you know, more effective design is the path. Exactly. So, so let's get into the integration. So one of the hot topics here this year, obviously besides cloud and AI, mm -hmm. which I, and cloud really being more of the, the driver of the tailwind for mm -hmm. the growth, uh, AI being more of the futuristic kind of headroom, is integration. Yep. You guys had some partnerships that you announced on integration. What are some of the key ones and why are they important? Absolutely, so um, you know, there have been attempts in the past to centralize all the data in one place, have one warehouse or one lake, have one BI tool, and those have generally failed, right? Um, because for different reasons, different teams pick different you know, stacks that work for them. What we think is important is they have a single source of reference, one hub with spokes out to all those different points. And if you think about it, it's kind of like Google, right? It's one index of the whole web, even though the web is distributed all over the place. So to make that happen, it's very important that we have partnerships to get data in from various sources. We have partnerships with you know, database vendors, um, uh, with, with uh, Cloudera and Hortonworks, um, with different BI tools. Uh, what's new that we uh, have announced recently are a few things. So one is with, with, with Cloudera Navigator, uh, they have great technical metadata around security and lineage over HDFS, and uh, that's a way to kind of bolster our catalog to go even deeper into what's happening in the files before things get surfaced in Hive or places where we have uh, a deeper offering today. So it's almost a connector to them in a way. You're going to share data. That's exactly right. We have a lot of different connectors, and this is one new one that we have. Right. Another, oh, go ahead. I was going to, go ahead, continue. I was going to say another place that's exciting is, is data prep tools. So, so Trifacta and Paxata are both places where you can kind of, again, find and understand inhalation and then begin to manipulate in those tools. We announced with Paxata yesterday the ability to click to profile. So if you want to actually see what's in yeah. some raw compressed Avro file, you yeah. can see that in one click. It's interesting, Paxata has really been, been almost lapping the uh, Trifacta because they were the leader in my mind, but now you got like a NASCAR race going on between the two, two firms because data wrangling is a huge issue, data prep, is where everyone's stuck right now. They mm -hmm. just want to do the data science, so it's interesting. They're both amazing companies, and we're happy to partner with both. And actually, Trifacta and Alation have a lot of joint customers we're starting yeah. to work with as well. I think what's interesting is with data prep, and this is beginning to happen with analyst definitions of that yeah. field, yeah. Um, it isn't just preparing the data to be used, getting it cleaned and shaped, it's also preparing the humans to use the data, giving them the confidence, the tools, yeah. the knowledge, and know how to manipulate it. And it's it. great progress. So the question I want to ask is, okay, now the other big trend here is, I mean, it's kind of a subtext in this show, it's not really front and center, but we've been seeing it kind of emerge as a, as a concept, is uh, something we, saw in, we see in the cloud world. On-premise versus cloud. On-premise, a lot of people are bringing the DevOps model in and saying, okay, I may move to the cloud for bursting and some, some native applications, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of work going on on-premise. A lot of companies are kind of cleaning house, retooling, replatforming, whatever you want to do, resetting. They kind of get in their house in order to do on-prem cloud ops, meaning a business model of cloud operations on site. Yeah. So a lot of people are doing that. That'll impact the storage. That's going to impact some of the server modeling. That's a hot trend. How do you guys deal with the on-premise cloud dynamic. 
Totally. So we, we want to just do, do what's right for the customer. So we deploy both on-prem and in the cloud, and then from wherever the Alation server is, it will point to usually a mix of sources, some that are in the cloud, like, like Redshift or S3 often uh, uh, with Amazon today, and also sources that are, that are on-prem. Um, I do think I'm seeing a trend more and more toward the cloud, and uh, we have people who are migrating from HDFS to S3 is one thing we hear a lot about at Strata with uh, sort of a Hadoop interest. But I think what's happening is people are realizing as each Equifax in turn happens that uh, this old Wild West model of, oh, you surround your bank with you know, people on horseback and it's physically <laughs> in one place, yeah. you know, with, with data it isn't like that. And yeah. most people are saying, I'd rather have the you know, A plus teams at you know, Salesforce or Amazon or Google be responsible for my security than people I can get and, over in the And the, the Paxata guys have loved the term data democracy because that's really a democratization, making the data free but also having the governance thing. Um, Absolutely. So talk about the data lake governance because you know, I've never loved the term data lake, I think it's more of a data ocean, but now you see data lake, data lake, data lake. Are they just silos of data lakes happening now? Are people now trying to connect them? Um, that's key, so yeah. that's been a, a key trend here. How do you handle the governance across multiple data lakes? Yeah, that's right, so the key is to have that single source of reference. Right, so that regardless of which lake or warehouse or little siloed SQL server somewhere, that you can search in a single portal and find that thing no and matter you, where it is. Can you guys do that? We can do that, yeah. I think, I think the metaphor for folks who haven't seen it really is Google. If you think about it, you don't even know what physical server it a web page is hosted from. The data lake should just, just be just invisible. Like Exactly. So you're an interface into multiple data lakes. That's a value proposition. That's too. right. That's right. It could be, could be on-prem, in the cloud, multi-cloud. Can you share an example of a customer that uses that and kind of how it's laid out? Oh, absolutely. So one great example of an interesting data environment is eBay. They have the biggest teradata warehouse in the world. They also have, um, I believe, two huge data lakes. They have Hive on top of that, and Presto is used to sort of virtualize across a mixture of teradata and Hive and then direct Presto queries. And so it just gets very complicated. And they have, you know, they're a very data-driven organization. So they have people who are yeah. product owners, who are in jobs where data isn't in their job title. And they know how to you know, look at Excel and look at numbers and make, make choices, but they don't, aren't real data people. Alation provides that accessibility so they can understand. Yeah, we used to call themselves. Hadoop World um, the car show for the data world where it, for a long time it was about the engine, what was, you know, what was doing what, and then it became what, what's the car and now how does it drive, right? So you've seen that same evolution now where, okay, all that stuff has to get done under the hood. Exactly. But there's still people who care about that, right? They're the mechanics, they're the plumbers, they're whatever you want to call them. But then the data science of the guys really driving things and, and now end, end users potentially. And if, even applications, bots or whatnot. So it seems to evolve. That's where we're kind of seeing the show change a little bit. And that's kind of where you, know, you see some of the AI things. So I want to get your thoughts on how you or you guys are using AI, how you see AI, if it's AI at all, if it's just machine learning yeah. <laughs> as a baby step into AI. Because <laughs> um, you know, we all know what AI could be, but it's really not AI, it's just machine learning. But now, how do you guys use, quote, AI and and yeah. how does it evolve? It's a really insightful question and great metaphor that I love, right? Because if you think about it, it used to be, you know, how do you build the car? And now I can drive the car even though I couldn't build it or even fix it. And soon I don't even have to drive the car. The car will just drive me. All <laughs> I have to know is where I want to go, yeah. right? And that's sort of the progression that we see as well. I think there's a lot of talk about deep learning and all these different approaches, and that's super interesting and exciting. But I think more interesting than the algorithms are the applications. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's like today, how do we get that turn-by-turn -turn directions where we say turn left at the light if you want to get there, and then eventually maybe the computer can do it, you know, do it for you, right? Yeah. Um, the thing that's also interesting is to make these algorithms work, no matter how good your algorithm is, it's all based on the quality of your training data. And Which so is a historical data. Historical data, in essence, the more historical data you have, you need that to train the data. Ex exactly right, and we call this behavior I.O. How do we look at all the prior human behavior to drive better behavior in the future, right? And I think the key for us is, you know, we don't want to have a bunch of, you know, You can actually get that URL, behavioral I.O. Oh, we should do it before it's too late. It's live right now. Don't register that, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, so, so the goal is, um, we don't want to have a bunch of underpaid interns trying to manually yeah. tack things that's error prone and that's slow. I look at things like, 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 like Luis Van Aan over at CMU, he, he does a thing where as you're writing in a CAPTCHA to get an email account, you're also helping Google recognize the hard to read address or, or you yeah. know, piece of text from Google I books. mean, if you shoot the arrow forward, you just take this kind of forward, you almost think, okay, augmented reality is a pretext to what we might see for what you're talking about, and ultimately VR. You're seeing some of the use cases for virtual reality be very enterprise oriented or even like a, in consumer. I mean, Tom Brady, best quarterback of all time, he uses virtual reality to 
to play the offense virtually before every game. He's a power user. In pharma, you see him using uh, virtual reality to do data mining without being in the lab. So lab time. So you're seeing augmentation totally coming into this turn by turn direction analysis. It's exactly. I think it's the other half of it. So we use AI. We use, we use techniques to get great data from people that have to do extra work, watching their behavior to learn what's right. Um, and, and I had to figure out those recommendations. But then you serve those recommendations. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, if it's Google Glass, like it appears right there in your field of view. So we should have to figure out how do we make sure that yeah. the moment of you're, you're making a dashboard or you're making yeah. a, a, a choice, that you have that information right on hand. So since you're a um, technical geek, um, and a lot of folks Absolutely. love to talk about this, I'll ask you the, the tough question, because it's something <laughs> that everyone's trying to chase for the holy grail. How do you get the right piece of data at the right place at the right time given that you have all these legacy silos, l latency is a network issue as well. Mm -hmm. So you got a data warehouse, you have stuff in cold storage, and I got an app, and I'm doing something. There could be any points of data in the world that could be in milliseconds, potentially on my phone, or in my device, or my internet of thing wearable. How do you make that happen? Because that's the struggle. At the same time, keep all the compliance and all the overhead involved. Is it more compute? Is it an architectural challenge? How, how do you view that? Because this is the big challenge of our time. Yeah, again, I actually think it's the human challenge more than the technology challenge. So it is true that there is you know, data all over the place kind of gathering dust, but if you can think about Google, billions of web pages, I only care about the one I'm about to use. So for us, it's really about being in that moment of writing a query, mm -hmm. you know, building a chart, how do we say in that moment, hey, you're using an out-of-date definition of profit, or hey, the database you chose to use, the one thing you chose out of the millions, yeah. that is actually broken and stale. And, and we have interventions to do that with, with our partners and through our own first-party apps that actually can change how decisions get made so in companies. To make that happen, if I'd imagine it, you'd have to need access to the data, yep. and then write software that's contextually aware to then run compute in context to the user interaction. It's exactly right. Back to the term return directions concept, yep. you have to know both where you're trying to go and where you are. And so yep. for us, you know, that can be the form of I'm writing a SQL statement after join, we can suggest the table most commonly joined with that, but also overlay onto that the fact that the most commonly joined table you know, was deprecated by a data steward or data curator. And so that's a moment we can change the behavior from bad to good. So a chief data officer out there, and we've got to wrap up, I want to ask one final question. Mm -hmm. As a chief data officer out there, they might be empowered or they might be just a you know, CFO assistant that's managing the compliance. Either way, someone's going to be empowered in an organization to drive data uh, science and data value forward because there's so much proof that data science works. Yep. From military to, to play, you're seeing examples where being data driven actually has benefits. So everyone's trying to get there. How do you explain the vision of elation to that prospect? Uh, because they have so much to select from, there's so much noise. It's like, we call it the tool shed out there. There's like a zillion tools out there, there's a zillion platforms. Some tools are trying to turn into something else, a hammer, trying to be a lawnmower. I mean, so they got to be careful on who they select. So what's <laughs> the vision of elation to, to that chief data officer or that uh, person in charge of analytics to scale operational analytics? Absolutely, so we say, we say, to, say to the CDO, we have a shared vision. Right, for this place where your company is making decisions based on data instead of based on gut or expensive consultants months too late. Right? And the way we get there, the reason the relation adds value is we're sort of the last tool you have to buy. Because with this lake mentality, it's like you've got your tool shed with all the tools, you've got your library with all the books, but they're just in a pile on the floor. Right? And if you had a tool that had everything organized, so you just said, you know, hey, hey robot, you know, I need a hammer and this size nail and this this textbook on on, you know, this set of information, yeah. and it could just come to you, and it would be correct, and it would be quick, yeah. Yeah. right? Then you can actually get value out of all the expense you've already put into this infrastructure. And that's especially true on the lake. So, and also, tools describe the way the work's done, so in that model, tools can be in the tool shed, no one needs to know what's in there. Exactly. You guys can help scale that. Well, congratulations, and just how far along are you guys in terms of number of employees, how many customers do you have? If you can share that, I know if that's confidential or whatnot. Absolutely, so we're small but growing very fast, planning to double in, in the next year. And, um, and in terms of customers, we have 85 customers, including some really big names. I mentioned eBay, um, Pfizer, Safeway Albertsons, Tesco, Meyer. And what are they saying so to you guys? Why are they buying, why are they happy? You know, so, so, so they share that same vision of a more data-driven enterprise where humans are empowered to find, understand, and trust data to make more informed choices for the business, and, and that's why they come and come back. And that's the product roadmap ethos for you guys, that's the guiding principle? Yeah, yeah, the ultimate goal is to empower humans, right, with information. 
All right, Aaron, thanks for coming. Thank you, Aaron Kalb, so co-founder, head of products for Elation uh, here in New York City for Big Data NYC and also Strata Data. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. We'll be right back with more after this short break. Thanks.